Hello and welcome to the official Scottish Rugby podcast, coming to you from the home of Scottish Rugby here at BT Murrayfield. I'm Jamie McMillan, and with me today I have former Scotland internationalist Al Kellock, Chris Patterson and Lindsay Smith. On today's podcast we hear from Scotland lead performance analyst Gavin Vaughan, Henry Purgos, Ali Price, Shade Monroe, Lisa Thompson and Boromir Rugby Club. I'll start off with you. Um, good weekend, did you uh, watch much rugby? I did, I watched a lot of rugby over the weekend, Jamie. Hello to everybody. Um, yeah, from Friday night through to Sunday, I think I I think I watched five games. Um, some great rugby as well. Uh, some rugby that's going to have uh, big consequences. Obviously, two teams through, which is, is massive. Uh, and a woman putting a fantastic performance in over in Spain, just getting the... Uh, um, beating just last kick of the game, or last... They had an opportunity to win it, I think, and uh, an, op- an opportunity to get a great result over there. Let's go back to the Edinburgh game, you know, here at BT Murrayfield. What a result for Edinburgh on Friday night. I was at the game, Mossy, I don't know if you were here yeah, at the game, yeah, you were here. So, yeah. um, great game, just your thoughts on that whole performance, because it, it really was a great result, wasn't it? Oh, it was a brilliant result for Edinburgh, a brilliant result for, for Scottish rugby, obviously qualifying Glasgow as well, but it, it was it was quite competent and quite content, really. It wasn't as if, that shows you how far Edinburgh have come and, and how, how well they're playing and how much understanding they have and how they're trying to play. It wasn't a shock that they won. I think everybody went in expecting Edinburgh to win against a team like Montpellier who have all the world stars and huge budget. Um, so it wasn't this, there was great elation at the end, but it wasn't surprise elation. It was almost building towards it. And the reason that I've said a couple of times is that Edinburgh know what makes them successful. Their building blocks are really good. Their set piece, their scrum, their line at the defence is outstanding again. And they went away in Toulon the week before, and they knew why they'd won. So it wasn't a surprise. They just had to go out, replicate it again. Um, and, and I thought it was a, a brilliant performance. Uh, I thought Montpellier played better as the game went on. They they probably tried to dominate physically um, in the first 20, 30 minutes, uh, but got no change at all because Edinburgh were, as I say, the building blocks are great, the defence is great, um, the game management was, was excellent. So it was a really sound, I don't want to, play it down but it's a really competent performance and in many ways that plays it up because it wasn't a shock that Edinburgh won they're playing at that level they deserve to win uh, and they've got a great opportunity in the quarter final it's, it's consistency isn't it like, you look at Edinburgh they had good the last year or so beginning to put good re- results together good performances together but they're now doing it consistently like the whole of December Edinburgh played well I thought the Toulon game Montpellier well, game here absolutely they played well but the Toulon game for me was probably the best performance of the season certainly going forward um some of the time, I mean, Bill Mattis uh, offload, that's world class. But other than that, the foundations were there and they were playing brilliantly. And to your point, mostly about the uh, the physicality, nobody nobody bullies Edinburgh. Uh, Ed- Edinburgh have got a pack now that will stand up against anybody in Europe. That's two weeks in a row against two of the giants. Now, they're not necessarily, too on especially, at playing their best rugby. But you look at them man for man, the money they've got to spend, Edinburgh shut down an incredibly good team two weeks, two weeks in the bounce. The thing about the Toulon game as well, like going into that atmosphere, every coach, every player, the first thing you'll talk about and the f- thing you'll focus on through the week will be getting a good start. Don't let these guys get into the game, surprise them right away, don't let them get a roll physically, don't let the crowd get up and within 90 seconds Edinburgh had conceded a try of exactly what they didn't want to happen. So it was actually even a better performance because it wasn't just after the try, I think the next eight or nine minutes was all Toulon. So Edinburgh had to wrestle that back the momentum that, that had lost through that early, the early try they'd conceded, they wrestle it back, get on top, and then completely dominate and, and go and win quite convincingly. Did you see? Uh, did you see the tweet that Edinburgh media team put out saying uh, something along the lines of, uh, "Oh, little bro." Yeah, yeah. Th- there you go, little bro. Yeah, oh. I think they were referencing the <laughs> cockers and the and the media that we could had mentioned his little brothers along the way, mate. So yeah, they picked up on that. Um, a little bit of good fun, I think. But it's always yeah, they did a good job with that. Did you obviously see the. The physio with uh, I think that's Bezmark, my favourite bit. Oh. Bezmark Duplessis, that was unbelievable. I don't know, brave man to go up against him because um, you must have played against him, Al, and maybe Moss as well, but you know, he's someone you, you maybe wouldn't run across in the rugby physio. Remember, uh, Not the physio, I, Bismarck Duplessis. <laughs> I don't know the physio that well, maybe you wouldn't. Size, but I think he got a fright when uh, Bismarck went back at him, but yeah. uh, Moss, you remember? Too uh, long. Too long. Stuart Barton. 2004, yeah. Uh, Trevor Brennan. Um, now, did he, Trevor Ben and belt somebody off the side of the park and then Barty threw his uh, physio bag at him? Mm, well. And then it all went from there. Big Craig Smith running off the bench and all sorts of things. Mm, well, it was a uh, yeah, quarter for the last time, well, the, the time before the last time, if you know what I mean. The first yeah. time Edinburgh reached the quarter final, we played Toulouse away. Um, 
and it was uh, it was just before half time I think it was a bit of skirmish in the touchline um, <laughs> Stuart Martin just came running across he was a fizz at the time with his bag and Trevor Bidding just came and wiped him out yeah. kicked him in the shin and wiped him out and we Bartley went flying all hell broke loose <laughs> I did, I mean, Graham Burns was on the bench and it was, was it, imagine it was, the, it was actually the stadium that was built for the French uh, Football World Cup in 1998 so it wasn't uh, Toulouse's home rugby ground it was the, the bigger venue in Toulouse and the, the dugouts that are kind of canopied over so you're sitting in the dugouts and Graham Burns jumped up whacked his head in the top of the dugout <laughs> never made it to the scalp <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting next to Craig Smith and it's the fastest I've seen him move all year I thought it was an opportunity to get into a fight from off the bench and get a wee barty he, he started on and just sailed away and let the big boys handle it. But it was a bit like that at the weekend. I think, uh, as I say, I think the Edinburgh Physio got a wee bit of a fright when Bismarck went back at him. <laughs> but hey, they were, uh, they were doing it all together. He had his part to play. It was interesting as well seeing, you know, I was at the game and, you know, seeing Vern. You know, he was, and he was down the touchline. You know, that that's a, a, a French trait, I think, isn't it, more than anything. You see the head coaches walking around, around the touchline. What, what's the the thing behind that? Do we know? Or is that it, well, you've got to wonder what the thinking is when he when he pulls the... Uh, was it tight head he pulled off? Yanni Duplessis, yeah. yeah Yanni right, Duplessis yeah. after, what, 30 minutes, 35 minutes or yeah, so? Yeah, he didn't make the, fir- the end of the first no, half. He was whipped off. And, and then there was a shake of hands and the way past. Uh, whereas at least if he was sitting in the stand, he could make that decision and, and speak to him after the game. I thought that was an interesting moment. I don't know if... I, I suppose it's... It's all down to where you feel as if you can get best view of the game. Now he feels obviously he can get a feel of the game uh, by being down there. Uh, <coughs> big Nathan Hines, I assume he would have been running water. I mean, yeah, he was right yeah. into it. So in the warm up, he's actively taking part in the warm up as well. But that'd be an interesting one for the, for those guys. Did you catch up with either of them afterwards? I spoke to uh, yeah, I saw them before the game actually on Thursday. They came in Thursday afternoon, so I saw uh, Nathan Hines and Vern and uh, Mark Hasty, the analyst. So uh, it's good to see him. But yeah. It's just preference, really, isn't it? Where you would stand, you obviously get a better view higher up. Um, but in many ways, I think maybe some coaches will think they'll have a bigger influence closer. Mm-hmm. And it depends on the, the maturity of your team. If your team need information passed to them, <laughs> you have to be in the, the touch. You don't see it often in rugby. Um, most of the information is passed through the week, and the players take ownership of it and deliver it. And, uh, but it was it was strange. Uh, I can see merits in both. I'd rather have a, a better view, and then, but at the same time, being there on the field, or well, side of the field, you, you could pass information more, but I suppose most guys are mic'd up and radioed up now, aren't they? Well, it's, uh, G- yeah. Gary Mercer used to stand behind the posts, mm-hmm. um, defence coach at Glasgow, because he felt as if he could get a better view, but to your point, everybody's mic'd up, it's also the video analysis that's sitting in front of you as well, so you'll get yeah. every angle, live, or as live if you want it, so... It's probably less need to move around yeah. the park to see it now. Yeah, we'll touch on that later on because I spoke to Gavon earlier the week and he talks about the importance of, of those feeds coming in and, and what it means to have them for the coaches. But one other thing from that game that um, I thought worth mentioning was apparently the, the owner of Montpellier was sitting in the coach's box and uh, he'd slit a cigar halfway through the second half. So um, I, think I remember it happening once year before <laughs> when Argentina were here. They just, there was cigarettes. Maybe that's why everyone was touching them. Yeah, maybe that's why they were just like him. cigars. But yeah, um, an interesting tidbit for that game. Um, after the game, we got to hear from Henry Pargos on that side's victory. Um, I think, again, our forward pack was huge. We knew coming in, Montpellier had a massive pack. They were going to challenge us there. I think our forwards really, you know, they were they were awesome today. In the scrum, line out, really got us into the game. Managed to, obviously, early on build a score. And then that second half, it was pretty tight again. But it's probably about game management and we got there in the end. Final, what does that mean for the boys? Yeah, it's big. Look, it's, again, amazing crowd today. Really drove the boys on. Hopefully, home quarter final in the next few weeks, whenever it comes around, we'll get another big crowd and we'll give it a good go. Henry Paragos there. I just want to touch on two things. Obviously, Edinburgh are now going to face Munster at home. Um, a winnable game, but it's never easy against Munster, especially when you get to this part in the tournament. What do you think that game will be like in a few months' time? <laughs> if you watched the Munster game at the weekend and it's anything like that it'll be a war of attrition I mean that was an old school forwards dominated game um, I don't think Edinburgh fear anything from that just uh, one thing on Henry himself how good's he been I mean oh, yeah. coming over coming over from Glasgow uh, that's that's tough because he was part of a successful Glasgow team mm-hmm. um, and he came over and he's grabbed it with both hands I thought I thought Henry was exceptional uh, yeah I agree weekend. I thought he controlled the game really well he put in some really good kicks which meant they could uh, pressure in the other areas of the field but yeah I think he's done really well since he's moved Darcy Graham's try in the corner the phase before Darcy scores or maybe two phases before you see Henry at the back of the rock and he just gives uh, Bill Matt a wee tap in the hip to say go to the blind side because they weren't defending the blind side that well um, so Bill Matt drops off they hit a phase up now they didn't score off that one 
but he's controlling guys without actually shouting. He sounds as if his, his voice has gone a bit there, so he's obviously been shouting a wee bit. But uh, yeah, I, I thought his control of the game was absolutely exceptional. Munster coming here, you know, I think uh, you know what you're going to get with Munster. They do it exceptionally well. It's a, it's a bit like Saracens, where Glasgow have to go. They've got, they've got a certain game plan, but they're exceptionally good at it. On Henry's, it's not the first time this season he's done that. Um, kind of delivered a scoring pass with the breakdown. As Ulster away, I think the second game of the season, he, he did it once, maybe twice. Done it. The Scarlet's here as well, uh, mm-hmm. in the early part of the season, and I think maybe uh, sort of like one of the Glasgow games as well. He's, he's so aware of what's going on around about him. Difficult when you're playing scrum half because your focus is on the ball, your focus is on everyone around the ball, but to to be aware of that kind of what's a wee bit wider out. Um, it's a bit standard on the Munster game again just food for thought do you treat it as a Champions Cup quarter final or do you treat it as a uh, just another game against Munster as you would do in the Pro 14 I know the obvious answer is oh it's a quarter final in Europe and crowd will be this that next thing but actually Munster's record in Europe take that away from them just play everything like it's a you know you're playing Munster your home record against Munster in the league is pretty good so it'll be interesting a bit of both maybe but it'd be interesting how you play that one. What would you do? Well, I think as we're all ex-players, but I think we would all look at it as just another normal game. Mm-hmm. You approach it like that. You go through all your processes through the week at mm-hmm. training. You know, yeah, it's a big affair, but that's when you kind of bank mm-hmm. on your fans to get behind you and make it more of an occasion. But you concentrate on the game itself. Yeah, the, the Richard Cook has got a, a vast amount of experience in that area. Uh, probably more as a player than he has as a coach, although he's still got a decent amount of experience there. So, yeah, I take your point, Chris, because you get to quarter-final, although this is Edinburgh's second quarter-final in, in recent times, mm-hmm. you can get carried away mm-hmm. with the with the event and you can get too focused on it being this big thing, this European quarter-final. And Munster know. are used to that and yeah, they like that, absolutely. don't they? That drives them on more than maybe other teams, or the, the, they respond really well to it. Edinburgh can respond well to it as well. It's just, neither the time, we're interested to see what the, what the tact is. Moving on to Glasgow, they were away at Saracens the weekend. Let's just get your thoughts on this first. You know, you were you work at Glasgow, so you're there during the week. You see all the preparation. It's obviously, a disappointing result. But what did you make of the game? Yeah, um, I thought the game was really exciting. If you, I would say, if you weren't a, a you know a big rugby fan to begin with, and you tuned into that game, especially the first half, six tries in you know, what 35 minutes. You know, um, I thought it was really entertaining. Both teams really trying to play an attacking uh, brand of rugby but I think we maybe tailed off a little bit in the second half and they started to build a bit more momentum um, which I think we maybe just didn't cope with in certain areas of the the field but um, I thought it was a much improved uh, performance by Glasgow um, and I think they were unlucky in the end. We're going to have to go back down there again Um, (laughs) you know three times in the space of I think two years was it last year they went down again or was it the year before? Two years ago. and can you look at that in a positive way, saying you know what to expect, or it's because it's the challenge of Saracens, it's always going to be a challenge. You know, you as an ex-player, would do you want to go down there again, or would you prefer someone different? Uh, like yeah, I, I was watching the boat game. I was watching the weekend. It was the Toulouse game, and the commentators were talking a lot about whether um, there'd be messages coming on about whether Toulouse should score at four tries and get the bonus point because if they did, they could end up having to go to Leinster, and if they didn't, then they would go to Racing. Um, and she's as a player, you're not concentrating on any of that. You're just out, out playing. Now, I don't believe, I mean, I mean, Mossy might disagree with me, I don't believe the Tillys coaches would have been putting messages on there. I think that they maybe took their foot off the gas because they thought the game was won. As far as guys going back to Saracens, you know, it's not a great challenge. But the, the, the players will, will revel on it. There are, there's a reasonable amount of history between those teams now, a reasonable amount of history between some of the individuals in the park as well. You saw it boiling over every five minutes uh, in that game at the weekend. Now, like it's, you know, everybody grabs each other's shirt and says nasty things to each other and it doesn't go much further but there'll be there'll be no inch given from Glasgow they'll be right up for it you look at the first half as Lindsay says it was really entertaining it was a great game of rugby and, and Glasgow showed at times the, 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 the excuse the cliche, cliche about the keys to unlock the, the Saracens defence not many teams will go down there and, and score uh, as freely as Glasgow did in that first half the worrying thing is now did, did the team's you know, find out how to, to take away the strengths from each other in the second half or did Saracens take over the game and did Saracens start controlling it Saracens were the better team especially lastly in that second half um, so Glasgow Glasgow know how to beat them they know how to uh, 
you know, to score tries against them. But ultimately, you're still going to the number one seeds uh, on a way match for a quarter final. But the fans will go down on mass again, I'm sure. It was windy as well, though, wasn't it? So Glasgow, yeah. when they were maybe having to try and chase the game a wee bit towards the end of the second half or the midpoint of the second half, they were into quite a strong breeze, which makes it you know, probably more difficult, especially the way that Saracens defend and how they fill the field. They put more players in the front line, so into the wind, that makes it even more difficult. You're probably going to have to, there's less space to run and it's harder to kick into the wind. But three tries, really good tries. I think there was a, a lot of good parts of, of Glasgow's performance. Um, and I don't think Saracens will be, that's just my opinion, but I don't think they'll be delighted at playing Glasgow again yeah. because they know how hard it is. They know how, as you say, the history between them. Now, does that then, is that something to pick on or, or focus on that takes your focus off the game? Like, there's so much going on, and does that then disrupt the flow? Or I don't know. I, I, I don't think they know how hard it is to play Glasgow. The uh, the game at Scotland and the opening weekend showed that as well. So there's not a lot between them, um, and I think maybe Saracens they'll, they'll be happy to be at home. They'll happy to take on on anyone. But I think it'll be a, a wee sigh in there. Oh, not Glasgow again. Do you think? Do you think the, the fact that it's boiling over as much as it was? Plays into Saracens hands or Glasgow hands. I think in the past it would have played into Glasgow hands, but um, Glasgow probably want the game fast. They want to keep it moving. Yeah, I do. yeah. I think they want to keep it moving and keep the ball alive, and you know, I think yeah. they want to run around them as much. But as you they also can. want to disrupt. Saracens are, are built on a a blueprint that is organised and structured, and you know, defence minded. Get the territory right, then bring the the kind of attack when you get close to the opposition line. So it kind of works both ways. But I think Saracens are a top seed, so the more you can disrupt the top seed, the better chance it gives the eighth seed of, of taking them on. Owen Farrell um, didn't play. He's gone for a, a minor, I think, thumb surgery or something. A, a strange thing, but um, he should be back, I presume, for the Six Nations. But um, does that sound like something that happened in training, a thumb injury? I mean, where does where does that type of could that happen anywhere or could happen anywhere? It's probably just them picking the right window to get it fixed. I mean, it's potential that he could have played on. Uh, I played not only in that game at the weekend, but potentially in the Six Nations. But you know, they've taken a decision off the back of the fact that they were already qualified. I don't know. I mean, we're, we're kind of trying to take a dive into something uh, that's happening behind closed doors at Saracens, but it sounds as if he'll be back pretty quickly. Did um, who, who was the player? It was it was, it was a rugby player that couldn't play because he broke or ripped his finger wrapping Christmas presents. <laughs> Is it you did did I make that up? <laughs> I thought you read it up. No, is that but I, you, I remember reading a story about somebody who couldn't play. It must have been a foil-based paper, then. <laughs> did you and Murray not do something like that? No, there's been a, a barbecue or there's something. There's been a few. No, he chopped his finger off. Did he not? Did he? Uh, did you, Murray, not you and Murray with his finger and Bar- um, Barkley landed in the glass, didn't he, before a a Calcutta Cup game? Yeah, and uh, Simon Taylor dropped a plate in his foot oh, when he was washing the dishes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's ever gone out, but it's Wash, out now. Say that again. He, he was washing the dishes and dropped a plate in his foot, and uh, did himself some damage and missed, missed a couple of games in the back right, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cut his toe. I'm going to find out who can play because. Of the Christmas present, that's my. You do that, I'll find out next week. That's the. I can't wait. Top <laughs> that'll, be in the, that'll be in the intro. <laughs> you and Murray's was chopping wood in the back garden. That's what it was, and he uh, <laughs> and he just about took his thumb off. I think. Yeah, uh, I remember that one, but there was a Christmas. Definitely somebody wrapping Christmas presents. I think you've made that one up. I think it might be you. <laughs> um, after the game, we heard from Dave Rennie and Ali Price. I thought we played really well in the first sixty. Um, yeah, 20 minutes after half time, we had a lot of ball. We uh, we uh, put them under a fair bit of heat and built pressures. Uh, but a couple of soft turnovers, you know, one strip, um, a couple of um, uh, you know, ruck penalties and that sort of thing, which gave them field position. So, um, well, it was, the attitude was great. It was, um, and I thought we put them under a hell of a lot of pressure for a big chunk of time, but. You know, in the end, uh, you, you got to turn pressure on the points. We didn't do that after half time, and um, you know, I think in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes, we just kicked too much ball away to them, and um, you know, they just kept coming back at us, uh, and in the end, it hurt us. But they're a good side. Um, I, I think you got to you got to get them out of their comfort zone, and that's what we tried to do. I mean, Ellie ran a lot early in the game because they're very good at filling the field, and. Um, we were able to poke a few holes through there and squeeze them up and then 
potentially play outside that. So I, th I thought a lot of that stuff we did really well early, and you know uh, we looked likely early in the second half too. And, but like I said, we needed a score uh, to get a little bit of scoreboard pressure on them. And uh, yeah, there was. It's always when you look back on a couple of key moments where maybe with ten something over, it's cost us ninety metres. They've got down the other end of the field, and then they've made us pay. They, they got they got big men that if you if you keep giving them the ball back, they're going to hit you. I think I think the nice job's easy when when you've got some go forward ball. Um, they were sitting off rucks, and um, yeah, I guess I've waited a while for for that really to kind of be able to play my game and and, and challenge a bit. But it, I don't know. It just comes with playing, I think. And um, me and George have played quite a lot. Um, you know, he started, I've started, and um, you know, it's just nice to get a bit of momentum and a feel for feel for playing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm back enjoying myself, which I think is the key thing. I, I kind of lost that um, at the end of last season, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying my rugby. The, the intensity we brought from the start was much better, but then that's where we need to that's where we need to play for the 80, not play for 50, 60. Teams like these don't die off. You know, they're just as fit as us and all the rest of it. Dave Rennie and Ali Pricer. Ali, brutally honest there, has, you know, how he felt towards the end of last season. Now, you know Ali quite well from your time at Glasgow. Um, a great player, but he's just obviously happy to find his form again. Yeah, and it's great to hear he's, he's enjoying it again. He was nicknamed Smiler. Um, because, he, I mean, there wasn't a day, he blew his knee out, and it wasn't a day we'd come back, he, he didn't come in with a smile on his face. Um, now, that goes from a player, then they, they potentially lose a bit of form. But, you know, he's in a difficult situation because both George, George Horn and himself are playing good rugby, but they're, they're taking chances away from each other. Um, now that's tough, it puts more pressure on the player. But even down, I thought we talked about Henry in the Edinburgh game, I thought uh, Ali down at Saracen, especially that first half, he was such a threat. And by being such a threat, he was dragging players onto him and then being able to release it. George came on and played, played well as well so George on the back has scored that try uh, against Cardiff last week they're pushing each other hard not just for Glasgow places but also for the Scotland place as well where they've got an awful lot of competition at night Mostly on that the competition obviously it's healthy to have that many nines but you know Henry as we mentioned earlier on just missed out I think Gregor touched on it in his team announcement last week that you know he's he's very close you know and he, he, he if he could he would probably have him in the squad but he's he got so much choice as a coach that's great but as a player is it just frustrating that you maybe for Henry and for Ali knowing that you hey. you know they get that time that game time um I don't think you think about not getting the game time I think you think about what you have to do to get your game time but it's kind of splitting hairs a wee bit but I think they'll, they'll try and control what they can control and they'll try and make sure that they're the one getting the start um, I think it's brilliant they've got so much depth I think it's uh, I think it's good as you know supporters obviously of the team and you know you've got you've got a lot of depth and I think as individuals everyone will always say it's great to have competition um, and they'll kind of partly mean it but partly <laughs> you know what I mean players don't mean it, mean it. <laughs> I, I, I think they do deep down I think they do deep down I think they, uh, they say it as if oh yeah it's great but I think deep down they'll be actually Oof, I just wish I was you know I was guaranteed a start, but I do think that the competition does push each other on. I think coaches will not manipulate that competition, but they'll, they'll, they'll you know, things that used to happen to us in the past, you'd be put in the same weights group or the fitness group or the same, you'd be in the lane next day, arrival on the fitness test and stuff like that. So, I mean, they do, coaches play on it and, and work it as well, which is important. Um, and deep, deep, deep down, I think they quite like having each other to push each other, especially as come halves, because they're, you know, they're quite close and then how they play they'll share a lot of information um, because the intricacies of this that next thing what do you do this scrum what are you going to do there Where's, you know they'll talk a lot about it props are the same props seem to have a kind of band of brothers they're both fighting for the same position but when they come off they'll tell each other the secret of the opposite number whereas well no every position's like that second row's interesting <laughs> because you've got second row's not like that well you've got two positions so you end up you, you end up forming little alliances uh, so you're always you end up like close mates and trying, you know, build this team together with somebody, and then at the same time, you know, trying to push somebody else off the end of the cliff. If you want any more information or content from Glasgow Warriors and Edinburgh Rugby, check out their websites at glasgowarriors.org and edinburghrugby.org. Also, Glasgow Warriors have their own weekly podcast, Warriors Weekly, which goes out every Wednesday. Uh, Lynn, let's just go back to the Scotland women's game. They were over in Spain on Sunday. 
29-24 defeat to Spain. You watched the game. Um, how did they play? Yeah, I thought they played really well. Um, in some areas of the game, you know, Spain kind of dominated them a little bit. However, they scored four really good tries. Um, Hannah Smith needs to get a mention. Um, she got two of those. Um, and she's just she's just outstanding. If you give her a bit of space, then she will make yards for you. She will po- probably make a line break. So it's just up to those other players, you know, to get around her and support her. But you know, I thought the scrum did really well. It held up. Um, they were strong, um, but they were just a little bit unlucky at some parts of the game where you know they let Spain turn them over. So I think they're in a good position going into the Six Nations. Um, but a special mention to Sophie Anderson. She got her first cap, so I know she'll be really pleased with that. She's just come back from a big injury, so I think that was a big um, tick in the box for her. It's a good game to have for Heather Six Nations, yeah. and uh, I don't believe we've done it before. But to stick that in a couple of weeks out from the beginning of the Six Nations, because the women, yeah, the like women are, they're not playing, it's not like you've got the bulk of the squad selected from, from two teams. There's a reasonable big spread, isn't it? Yeah, no, there's a good spread now. And obviously we've got a couple of girls who play across in France. Um, a big number of the girls are playing down in the English Premiership as well. Um, but, you know, I think we're starting to be able to select from more teams now, which we didn't use to in the past. So um, it's showing that our kind of development programmes are starting to... Um, work um, but yeah no, I thought the girls did really well and um, I think Shade might have a bit of a headache selecting his team going forward It's not just the Italian game it was the, the Canadian game as well Scots and back in was that October, November? Uh, November, November yeah So like two games that like Canada and Spain are two pretty good teams in the, the women's rugby as well aren't they? That they're, uh, yeah, definitely. Like this quality, is the first quality. time they've played like in autumn inter- internationals. And um, we've played games in the past where they've been they've been dubbed as warm up games. But it's you know this is the first season we've played actual mm-hmm. full internationals. Um, and so it's a time of the year where the girls haven't been together as a squad before. So um, I think the kind of feedback I've heard from some of the players it's been really positive. Um, they've got a lot out of that extra time together as a squad so um, yeah I'm quite excited to see how they do in the Six Nations now and they did it good performance not quite the result but with no Jade Conco as well yeah that would be a big loss um, for the team but um, I think they showed yesterday that you know they can still put in a really good performance um, but they can be even better when somebody like Jade's there as well just touch on the the BBC album element as well it's a huge um a huge equipment made by them last year. Um, Lynn, you're not involved on in, in, in pitch anymore, but you, you, you're still involved. You've got friends in the squad and, and teammates. How much of a lift does that give them, knowing that, that people are taking it seriously now and BBC Alba are covering women's game in Scotland? Yeah, no, I think it's massive for them. Um, certainly in the past, when we didn't have anyone <laughs> um, covering our games in terms of like TV coverage, um, it was all on like word of mouth, social media, things like that. But having it on BBC Alba now, it's massive. People can watch it at home if they can't make it to the game. Um, so I think for the girls, it's it's huge. Um, and it means they can also watch it back as well uh, <laughs> without the analysis side of it. Al, <laughs> oh, you were involved in the uh, on the commercial side, doing your commercial role with, you know, getting them a sponsor. You know, just talk through that. You know what it means for you guys to to pull in a sponsor like that for the women's game. Well, for, for the first time, there's an independent sponsor, SP Engine Networks, in the front of the the women's jersey. First time in a professional era. Um, but some of the conversations we have commercially are, are great because the, the, the product that's getting produced is, is fantastic. The crowds are going up and up. Scots are beginning to make it a, a very tough place to come and, and play. Um, so yeah, I think the you know the performance and the commercial go hand in hand when when one's going well, so over the other. Um, but like the the BBC album, when going back to that, um, I heard somebody say the other day, you, you can't be what you can't see. So as far as yeah. getting more girls playing the game. Um, they can go to the games clearly, but the ability to watch them at home as well, and and, and be inspired by the performances they're putting in, will mean we'll get more girls picking up the ball and, and enjoying rugby. Just need to get over the the, the kind of close defeat, isn't it? If you think Spain, Canada, the one point, I think the opening game last year in the Six Nations was one point away to Wales. I remember yeah. watching that game. Um, how do you think they can can he get over that? It just almost looks as if it just like a wee bit confidence to go out and really win that yeah, crucial think, moment or is it just time in the saddle, just time together playing? I think it's time together yeah. and learning to win mm-hmm. as well. When we played Ireland at home two years ago, we lost in the last, what, 83rd mm-hmm. minute? <laughs> they crashed over and, you know, I think at that time we were obviously devastated but 
you know, when you think back, back, we weren't probably ready to win a game like that. You and won then the Welsh win that. Yeah, we then won the, won the Welsh minute. game, mm. yeah. Um, so I think we kind of learned from that, and mm. I think the girls have had those awesome tests to learn. You know, they know what it was like when they played Canada and they came so close. Mm. So, you know, I think they'll take that into the games um, this year. So. Le- learning to win, I think that's that's probably the, the, the key comment in there. Most of you and I have both been part of teams where... Um, we're not, we slow weren't learners. necessarily <laughs> slow, learners. <laughs> we <were> slow learners. We weren't necessarily <laughs> competing, uh, and then all of a sudden you compete in games and you're difficult to play against. Yeah. And it's not that big a step to then go in and, and be winning those games consistently. Now, I think if you look at the journey the women have been on in the last few years, they've become a team that's hard to play against. <clears throat> um, now, to your point, the, ne- the next stage is to how you go on and you take that confidence from winning games. I think that only comes from, you know, getting those close victories and then pushing on for them. If you look at the last few games that have been close, and there's definite things in there, especially the Canada game, and then even um, on Sunday there, in leading, was it 12 10 at half time? Yeah, they went into the half time. And they just lost yeah. that maybe third quarter, I think, before Chloe scored later on. To, yeah, it's to almost like half time came too, too yeah. early for us. But um, yeah, I think we've definitely improved massively over the last couple of seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't see us going. I was just say it's getting better and better. So Canada game at Scotland was a brilliant game. That was amazing. Yeah. There was a huge crowd. You mm. know, you could hear the crowd getting behind the girls, and you could almost see the belief in the players as the game went on, um, which I thought was really good to see. Brilliant, positive stuff for Scotland women. Uh, and after the game, we caught up with Shade Monroe and Lisa Thompson. They are ranked at the currently ninth in the world. And we are ranked eleventh, so it was really good for us to test ourselves against the higher ranked team as we prepare. Uh, and build towards the Six Nations. The game itself, we started particularly well. Um, We were definitely the better team. The tempo was quite good. Uh, We scored a couple of tries and by half time, we'd managed to establish a 12-10 lead. Um, Now we started the second half in the same manner, but then we actually took our foot off the pedal. Now we're not used to a team being in the lead uh, that often, certainly historically. So that was certainly something that was new to them. You could see that that affected them in a way. Um, Spain came back into the game because they increased their intensity of what they were doing. And to be fair to them, scored a couple of good tries, but they were mainly from our mistakes. So it's certainly something for us to look at as we build towards uh, the Six Nations. So certainly a very good exercise for us. By the end of the game, we were back into playing well. Uh, We increased the tempo. creating quick ball at the breakdown and we uh, resulted in a try to finish with which was good we scored four tries today um, so quite happy overall it's certainly not all doom and gloom uh, we'd have liked to have won but it was a great test uh, and a great preparation for us going into the Six Nations a great match against Spain today um, I think we've built a lot from the autumn test against Italy especially that game against away um, and from the Canada game uh, we scored four tries away from home which I don't think we've done in a long time um, but we'll just look to take that and carry on hard and speed of bullet and everything we do in training and look to take that in early and start the Six Nations at Scotstoun. Let's look over now to the Tenants Premiership. Mossy, you keep a close eye on that. Air still top of the table. Some interesting results from the weekend. Yeah, uh, Air are doing really well. Peter Murch is coaching down there. A lot of good players. The um, uh, top league at the moment with 66 points. Melrose second, Carey third, Herod fourth. What's only his fifth? So obviously there's only uh, there's only two rounds left of the regular season this weekend, and then there's a break until the start of March. So um, yeah, I think the uh, era are, are obviously out in front. The big game this weekend, Melrose play um, play Carry at the Green Yards, uh, and it's top one and two that get home semi final as we know for the playoffs. So that Melrose are, are second and sixty one, Carry third and fifty eight. So that has a big bearing on. Um, potentially getting that home semi-final uh, so that'll be the, a, a real important one this uh, this weekend coming but um, Merrill's lost at home to Heret uh, Hawks and Edinburgh Aki's two teams towards the bottom end of the Premiership <laughs> for a 15-14 game uh, Hawks come out on top of ball grade just by a single point um, and here as you say went down to Hoyk and, uh, and came out 36-12 victors so the um, it's always difficult this time is the season there's a club international fixture uh, coming up as well there's a warm up game tomorrow against the under 20s um, a lot of these players will be involved in the club international I did a session involved with a session with the club international players last Monday night and they're, they're in pretty good shape a lot of good individual players um, well coached but, uh, head coach Bob Christie um, so it's quite interesting they'll, they'll play alongside each other on the Tuesday and then play against each other on the Saturday they know each other well but 
Um, it's a it's a difficult kind of part of the season because they say there's a, it's fractured a little bit. At the Christmas break, two or three weeks on, two or three weeks off, and then the last uh, regular games, I think the second of March, before the semis. But um, yeah, Ayr sent leading, Melrose second, Carry third, Heris fourth, and Watsonians have the, the chance to to get into that top four as well for a semi final place. Brilliant. Would you like some news? Yes. I've got some. What have you got? I've got some good news. I was going to say breaking news, but by the time we get this out, get Laura out there, I think. Delighted to announce that we'll sold out Italy for the Six Nations game. So that will make it for the Six Nations our 12th, 13th, and 14th consecutive sellouts. Fantastic achievement for everyone involved, but uh, more so for the Scotland team to know that they're going to be playing in front of a, a full house. Mossy Al, Lynch, you've, you know, as internationals, knowing there's going to be a good crowd there. How much does that help you? Greg has talked about it for the whole time he's been coached. The atmosphere here is better than it's ever been. People are wanting to come and watch Scotland play. Scotland are playing such great rugby and it makes a massive difference for the players out in the park. When you when you run out for the warm-up and the noise hits you straight away or there's a, a moment in play where the, the refs blow each whistle and the crowd get behind you, it gives you that lift. It makes you play better, undoubtedly. Well, obviously, other news just to talk about this week. Gregor named his squad for the Six Nations and he's just updated it today with some more players. Um Obviously, a, a big injury list. Moss, you touched on it earlier on. You know, he's almost got another team in that injury list. Um, who are the key kind of names that jump out for you in that that injury list? Oh, well, there's 19 on it. Uh, I'll be more after the, the weekend as well. Uh, obviously, and some of those more serious than others. But uh, I think the fact that we've got a squad of 39 announced last week, and then I think 19 on the the injured or unavailable list shows you the depth of talent we have. Um, the uh, you can only play who's fit, obviously. So the, the focus is quite rightly on on the guys who, who are uh, who are able to take part and able to train and, and build towards the, the game against Italy um, in a couple of weeks' time. But there's a couple of names that jumped out at me on the injury list just because we've not seen them in a Scottish shirt for for a while, and they're, they're, they could be so influential. And Richie Gray and Duncan Taylor, two world class players in my view, that haven't played a lot of rugby for Scotland. I think Richie came off the bench last year in Italy, and you know they've just had such horrid luck with injury. Um, obviously, Barclays and Fraser Browns and you know Denton and McGuigan. I mean, it's, a, it's such a huge list. But those were when I was reading the, the kind of injured list were two that jumped out. That actually, the, the the depth of talent we have allows us to have two long term injuries like that. And 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 I suppose a bonus when these guys do come back. All about kind of rivalry and competition of places before. It'll just get stronger and stronger. You're not going to get everybody fit at the same time. Um, it just won't happen. You probably won't always play in a game feeling 100. percent You'll carry a knock or a bump and bits and pieces. So you have to manage yourself and manage your, uh, I suppose your 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 body through your Six Nations, especially because it's so condensed. But 39 players to, uh, available plus 20 injured or so. There's, there's a lot of good players in our in our wee country. Mossy touched on Richie there. You know Richie well from your t- your time at Glasgow. He'll be really hungry to feature in the Scotland setup again because he's think he's only played once under Gregor. When you think about that, that's remarkable. But yeah. he's just had a bad run of injuries. How Is much that will right? he once? I think he's only played once. I think he came on as a substitute. It was in Italy uh, last year. He came uh, from uh, yeah. Italy. And that was it. I think that's. Um. I think it's only once because he he didn't go on the tour. He's not been any tours, mm. and then he's been injured. But um, he, just, he can't get any luck. Don't get the same. Like they you go through spells like this in your career um, at times where it seems to just be one thing after another and that's the way Big, big Rich is at the moment he's been in and around the camp um, and he's, he's been across to see the guys when, when he's to lose diary allows um, but yeah he did right he'll want, he'll want back in that squad it's, it's clearly a big year certainly World Cup in Japan coming up as well um, Do you think you get that time back at the end of your career? I think it depends on the, on the type of injury I think at times you do absolutely oh, yeah. um, even mentally Um like you know, just, just if you can imagine, you're, you've got say two years off in the middle of your career, you may play longer than anticipated because your body's had a rest and recuperated. Yeah, you've had your injury, you've recovered from. But I reckon I, I might be wrong, but I, I think you probably will lengthen your career by having it, you know, kind of cut short in, in the middle. If that makes sense, I don't know. As long as, as long as one of those big injuries isn't doesn't. Injury, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, less wear and tear. And I think Chris Custer is a good example of that. He mm. picked up some big injuries. Mm. Nathan Hines as well. Nathan Hines, uh, big sho- shoulder injuries with Chris in particular, but the wear and tear on his body was a lot less. Mm. Um, 
So actually, when he, when he finished the game, he, he still had a good bit of time left in him. He could have mm-hmm. definitely kept playing. Um, but as other guys, you'll see that have played consistently. Then mm-hmm. you know it's a wear and tear that gets to them more than the big injuries, probably. But R- Richie McCaw, did he not take a year off? He took a sabbatical for a year, and did that prolong his career? I don't know. Did he come? He definitely didn't retire. He came back. Yeah, he, well, it was, it was uh, pre World Cup, um, and yeah, I think it's psychologically that there's a big thing to be said for that. So we'll get away from the game, like. We had Ali Price earlier on talking about falling back in love with the game and joining his rugby. Yeah. You know, when you step away from it, um, if you think of the, the option of the ability to step back in, then that'd be brilliant. I mean, I'd, well, I was going to say six months out, I was keen to go back. I wasn't, I'd be telling lies. <laughs> you <laughs> still bring your boots to work. Who's <laughs> <laughs> available? Dave, I'm fit, pick me. Um, the high cut ones and the nails in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you know that you've got a set amount of time away from the game to switch off from it completely, uh, you can you can then get back into it. George Off talked about it as well when mm-hmm. he, he was away from it. And he, he was he was cycling up the uh, French Alps and doing all sorts of things just mm-hmm. to switch off from rugby. Um, I think you've got to be a certain, certain type of athlete to be able to do it as well because you know six, take, take time off. Yeah, I think six months out could have a big uh, yeah. impact on your rugby player ability. Do you not? Yeah, I do. If you're not, you know, you're not doing it day in day out. Um, it might take you a wee bit of time to get back up to where you were before you took your break. Is there a worry as a player though, taking yourself away from the game for a amount of time that you come back and that slot's been filled by somebody else? And that must go through your mind as well. You know, there's always there's constant competition. So is that something to think about as well? Yeah, I, th- I think when I was still playing, you know, you thought about maybe I should take a bit of a break and come back to it in a bit so I can do some other things. But you've still got that thought. You're like, well, if I step away from it now, I might not get back in again. Um, so, yeah, I think players are better now. Like the, the teams are rotated a lot more. That yeah. you, you're not expected um, or probably wanting to play every game. Um, whereas when we first started coming through, there was the strongest fifteen, and nine times out of ten, that fifteen was picked. Now that probably said something about the depth as well. But there's good. Like you mentioned, Richie Gray, there. But you look at the second rows that are in that that Scotland squad without him. Now I expect that there'll be game time given to them all. Um, yeah. Some guys take it better than others when somebody else has got their jersey for a while. Uh, um, another, I like, like, as I say, it's more part of the game now than it probably was when we were playing, Chris. Yeah, I think if you were, if you knew you were taking time out, you would do it with a clear head that you had a long-term plan. I think if if you've got a, sh- a short-term plan or you're just desperate to play the next game week or can't face to see someone else in your jersey. Um, it's different, but I think if you've got a long-term plan, actually, if I take this time out, it's going to give me the best opportunity to get my place back, to play better, uh, and knowing that, you know, the, the especially the depth of sco- the squad that, that Scotland have now, Scotland's going to be all right without you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, they, they will be, they might even be better, but for me to improve and me to, to get the best chance of getting my place back consistently or, or just even get away mentally, as Al said, uh, a bit of long term planning I think it's maybe not a bad thing I, I couldn't have done it I would have hated it um, I would just have to keep playing and playing and playing I would, I would be one of those selfish guys that couldn't give it up for two or three months or six months I don't think I could have done it rugby wise no. um, a prolonged period out of the game I, I don't think I would have got back rugby wise to where I needed to be uh, physically you probably would end up come back in a far better condition and the game changes quicker now than it did when we played though yeah. I think yeah, see, I think it's a bit different on the, from the women's side of it as well because mm-hmm. obviously it's, it was your day-to-day job, whereas for a, a lot of us it mm-hmm. wasn't. So it was if you took a step back from it, you know, like I might just, you know, kind of not come back to this. Something else comes up, or but I think from a kind of male point of view. Well, you see, you see, you know, I was chatting earlier on uh, with Hoggy actually. We should talk about uh, Rory Best, mm-hmm. um, and le- I saw him leading out the team, and Rory is probably only a couple of years younger than me, and he's still going strong. But it looks, he, like he looks a lot. He, are you joking? Yeah, uh, same hairline. <laughs> <laughs> but he he doesn't play that much in the, the kind of week to week Pro 14 games, and then gets rolled out for the big uh, Heineken Champions Cup games and the and the Irish games. And now there's a few of the guys like that in the Irish squad. Now they've done it. We, we, when we played Moshi, we didn't we didn't play Brian O'Driscoll, Gordon Darcy, Paul Connells week to week. Um, they were they were safe for the bigger games. I think that would be hard as well. Yeah, I, I, I think you um, different points in your career and different bits and pieces. But like if you're in a run of form or you're in the groove, you want to keep playing and keep playing and keep playing. And 
uh, it sounds hard, but the, the time where you're really struggling, that's probably a time where you, you should kind of take a step back and think, actually, how, how can I get better? But I think, the again, going back to long-term planning, I think the, the, the kind of coaches and performance directors will plan for the players. It won't be the player's decision in the, in the kind of Irish model or, or what you know happens in Scottish rugby when players have to be take a, a week off. That, that's long-term plan. It's not just thrown in one day and, you know, it wasn't an X. So um, it's all part of player welfare um, and also try to get the best uh, at the, the individual you have. Were you good at uh, Were you good at mentoring young players and bringing them through? Uh, I, I, I thought it was really important, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was part of a mentor. I don't know if this is what you're alluding to, but I was part, <laughs> of, I was part of a mentoring uh, programme with Winning Scott Foundation and the player that I mentored was Tom Brown. He's still with Ben now, but he took my place. So <laughs> I was either a really good mentor or uh, I shot myself on the foot, one of the two. <laughs> Yeah, I, did, I was uh, part of a similar process and uh, the first player that I mentored was Richie Gray who took my Scotland jersey and then Johnny Gray who took my Glasgow jersey so good mentor same, good mentor that's exactly the same opinion as you were has that gone much in the women's game once you got um, I think it's starting to come into effect now um, we kind of were more like we had a leaders group rather than certain mentors but um, yeah I think we're kind of pitched as good role models make sure you behave you know portray the right image which most of the girls do well she was one of my first mentors still still remember walking out um towards training in 2006 and saying to you uh, i've got something i need to tell you I'm, I've, I've signed for glasgow <laughs> you've what <laughs> yeah, I've, I've signed for glasgow I'm, I'm leaving next year um how many caps you get for Edinburgh? Uh, oh, 50, between 50 and 60, I'm not sure exactly. He know. <laughs> you know exactly how many caps you got. I don't yeah. know. That's First your... time I came across Al, it was, a, it was a, an Edinburgh kind of pre-season training stroke bounce game on the back pitch. I think it was Stirling. And it was just like a training night again that turned into a kind of more full-on game. And there was this guy in the setting row with a grey scrum cap at the time, but he had long hair, I think. Oh, I've heard this it. Story. Oh. The, the hair was like sticking at the top of the, the hat. Yep. And he was just getting in the way. Like. He was <laughs> clumsy, swinging for everybody, tripping everybody up. And I eventually lost it and grabbed him by the scrum cap. I had a swing at it because I was like, who is this guy? Yep. Furiating. And there he was. And that was him. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that was him. Are you sure that wasn't Scott McLeod? Blonde highlights coming through the hair? No. <laughs> Take you back to your roots, Al. <laughs> the old highlighted tip hanging at the top of the scrum cap. It was a great scrum cap. Another injury from the weekend, unfortunately, was Hamish Watson, who's gone off with a, a hand injury. Another one in the back row. Al, you know, it's, it's tricky, isn't it, when you've got that injury list gets bigger and bigger, especially in a, in a position where they're already quite stretched. Uh, what, Hamish Watson obviously brings a lot, doesn't he? He brings a lot. Now, there's a lot of quality in the back row. John Hardy's playing exceptional well at Newcastle. Um, Jamie Richie's been brilliant for Edinburgh. There's, there's, there's people that can go in and, and replace that. What what I worry will be missing is that Hamish Watson's a fantastic ball carrier as well. As well as doing every job that a seven needs to do, he's great with a ball in hand. Now that maybe means that Gregor needs to look at the balance of the team, potentially look at the second row and who's going to step up there and carry a wee bit more ball. Um, he's a big loss, he's a big loss for any team. I, I, I'm a huge fan of Hamish Watson's the physicality that he brings to every game is brilliant. When was the last time it would have been a, a contender for Man of the Match in an international. Well, that tells you how consistent it is. Almost every game internationally, home or away, win or lose, is always in that kind of short list come the, the end of the game when when, uh, when they're, they're looking to award a, a Man of the Match. It's brilliant. It's been outstanding. Every time he gets the ball within, say, 10 metres, I think he's going to score. Because it, yeah. it takes about three guys to take him down. And even when you think he's tackled up, he gets again and goes again. So it's, it's a big loss. Um, but as I say, the cover's there. It's the balance of the team yeah. now. I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think there's there's a lot of good. I think we always produce good back row players in Scotland. That we do um, huge amount of talent. Uh, but I think the key is that the balance has to be right. Whoever comes in will be excellent players. We, we've got loads of excellent players. It's just does it suit the balance of the game and the balance of each other? So Sam Skinner may shift back to the back row with the we've spoken about the depth and the setting row already. Um, so he might might come in there. Um, I'd agree with you. I think Jamie Ritchie's been brilliant as well. I think the uh, um, the one thing that was going to his biggest work on was his discipline in terms of giving penalties away in and in the breakdown, and he, he stopped doing that. I, I know the kind of was asked was it in, in the autumn just to 
you know, all that classic kind of hands on the ground going over the ball trying to win the turnover um, he's completely taken that out of his game so um, shows you how, how how willing to accept things to work on a guy like that is and um, he's been outstanding so you see he would kind of grew up most of his rugby as a seven um, so he can maybe slot in there as well he played in the game that made me want to retire uh, I was coming back from injury and we played in the back pitches uh, Glasgow Edinburgh and there was Jamie Ritchie and quite a few young lads coming through from Edinburgh at the time um, and not only is he an exceptional player he's, he's got a little bit of nastiness in him as well because he was at me for I don't know how long I played for that goes around, comes around now. <laughs> 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 exactly you're dead right and I didn't have a leg to stand on and I remember coming off the park and I'm speaking to Jason White who was my agent at the time and I was like Jace I'm done <laughs> that'll do me yeah, was also with Hamish I always forget is that he he just missed out in the 2015 World Cup squad as well. You know, in that four years, he didn't go to the World Cup in 2015. And you're a player of that quality, now you think, how did, you know, it's amazing to think he didn't go to the World Cup. But best luck to Hamish in, in his recovery. Uh, moving on, earlier this week, I caught up with Scotland League performance analyst Gav Vaughan to tell us who he is and what he does. Gav, I know who you are and, and what you do around the, the Scotland national team, but for everyone listening, just tell us who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Gavin Vaughan. I'm the lead uh, performance analyst with the national team. Um, me and my team are responsible for providing all the players, coaches um, with valuable information, statistics, uh, backed up with video uh, about opposition and um, about ourselves and methods of how we can improve at training and uh, always try and kick on, really. You talked about the opposition there. A question I've always wanted to ask you um, is when you're preparing for a match, you know, how much time do you spend looking at Scotland, yourselves and the opposition? You know, in my head, it's a 50-50 split, but how much time do you give to each team? Well, in national rugby, we're very fortunate that we get a lot of time between our games, but also keeping in mind that things change in those periods of time as well, so you can't dwell too much on the past, particularly for your first two or three games. So I would say in the week, we're probably around a 60-40 split, um, for the first part of the camp would be more 80-20 but um, yeah it's probably around the 60-40 always having an eye on the opposition seeing what they're doing seeing if there's any trends coming uh, to the fore um, any little edge really that we can get and any insight in how the team's going to play and how we can prepare to, to get the win So how much rugby do you think you watch in a week if you I put a number on it I broke up my uh, PB the other day most of the boys speak about PBs in the gym I speak about PBs uh, in front of the TV so um, now I watched 18 games of rugby over a weekend different games um, I've got a lot, a lot of players playing um, in different clubs so that was uh, my number one reason looking at opposition guys and then always looking at again trends of the game and whatnot and yeah, I was pretty much glued to the TV and my laptop for a couple of days. When we see you and, you know, when it comes to the crunch time and a match, you know, we often cuts to the coach's box and we see you and your team up there, you know, working hard and the laptops are open. What's happening there? What's on the laptops? What are you doing? Are you starting to tag players there? Or are you preparing clips for the coaches? What's the whole process there? So we're, getting, we're very fortunate at national level again. We get four um, different angles come into the box from the broadcasters. Um, ranging from what you see on TV to close-up angles, wide angles and uh, behind the post angle so it gives us a full perspective of how the game is being played so we're live tagging that and coding um, the game as it's going on and producing li our own live stats similar to what you see on TV but specific for us and certain stats which are more relevant to winning and losing matches than just generic stats there's also player stats, uh, player data coming in so we've got monitors around us where we're getting the data coming in, we're sharing the video with the coaches and we're also keeping an eye on how we've prepared and if things have changed from when we prepared and looking to, towards half time where we'll normally deliver two or three key clips or um, messages from the first half for how we can kick on to win or maintain our form. And that must be quite a tricky process for you sometimes, depending on where you are. So at home, obviously, you know the stadium, you know the infrastructure. But you know, when we were in Fiji a few years ago, I can imagine that to get those clips down to the changing room might not be as easy as it would be here. I mean, it must be 
a trial and error process for you depending on where you're where you're playing and what's going on is that is that a fair point yeah no it's very challenging sometimes like you mentioned Fiji that was probably one of the more diverse ones for us and we're very fortunate that we get to play in some really cool stadiums and big big places but you do have the the odd one which uh, does make you think a bit more and have backup plans and maybe strip back your process a little bit but um, yeah we try and be consistent with what we can deliver week in week out so that's a big part that again the same information to help the team win which is the common goal really. One of the things I remember about you and, and your role at Glasgow Warriors was that you it was almost like a you had the scouting role where you, you you were constantly looking and you were kind of the, the key anchor to, to bring in new players you know I think Leone Nakarawa and uh, Nico Matawalu, another one maybe. Um, you know, you, you you had the real knack for finding these these players. Um, Hugh Jones, another one that I know that you you, you were fond of. But a, how much do you enjoy that whole process of of digging out you know, these kind of brilliant players that we maybe hadn't seen before? And now you're in the national setup. Do you still have a kind of involvement in that kind of process of of scouting and looking at, at players around the world? Yeah, um, I, I love that part of the job and it probably comes with watching so much rugby that you get to see some all sorts of uh, games at different levels and um, yeah, that, that's where I kind of developed that kind of interest and to be honest, I didn't re- realise that it was something that I could probably you know excel and offer a bit more value to the team at the time and recruitment's so important, particularly for the pro teams, um, that you've got to be smarter in Scotland, that we don't have budgets of England or France, so we have to be a bit more strategic about the people we approach um, and identify. So, yeah, it, it came from probably watching so much rugby and just seeing these guys running around and carving up in different levels. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's something I do miss, but I'm still in contact with both pro teams and um offering help if they need it and when I've got time Um, and from a Scotland perspective I'm always watching out for Scottish qualified players from all levels, junior levels right the way up so I've got more of a Scotland hat on now on the recruitment front but no I really enjoy that part of the job, it's it's, it's good. First up it's Italy here at BT Murrayfield, now you spent a bit of time in Italy before you went to Glasgow Warriors Um, just talking through your time there, I think you went straight from Wales to Italy without knowing the language so yeah I had uh, a two day notice uh, do you want the job I had a phone call on the Thursday and the flight was booked for the Saturday um, that was with Ironi who are now Zebra uh, so I know quite a lot of the Italian players um, yeah that was some experience um, great place to live great people uh, the rugby was some difficult times at, at that time and the club were in a bit of financial trouble but um, it was a massive learning curve for me in, in my role and uh, no, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'd like to think I've got a little bit of insight into the Italian style of play and a bit of psy- their psyche, uh, which can hopefully give us the upper hand uh, coming up. 18 games of rugby. Al, how many did you watch the weekend? Five, but it's not my job. <laughs> Lindsay, how much did you watch the weekend? Four. Mossy? All of them. Um, <laughs> wow, good answer. <laughs> now, we all, know, we all know Gav quite well. Lindsay from your time oh, at Glasgow. Wow. You as well, Al at Glasgow, and Mossy from the national team. You know The amount of hours and, and effort these guys put in it's a really c- crucial role, though, and, and and coming to you, Mossy, on that, you know, the the analysis side of things, the detail they can give you is is crucial, isn't it? Right, it's it's, um, uh, it's probably would it be the most important part, or, or up there with one of the most important parts? That the an analysis is it's worth um, probably trying to describe what it is. It's not just watching games; it's looking for detail upon detail on an opposition as individuals, an opposition as units, as forwards, as backs, as lineups, as scrums, as defence from the left-hand side of the field, the right-hand side of the field, what the, the, the team do, where the, the strengths are, the weaknesses, there's analysis done on referees. It, it's so in-depth. Um, and the players want it, and they want to know all about it, and they want to know immediately. So uh, the, the, the the work rate that Gavin and his staff put in um, is just phenomenal. I mean, immediately after the game, obviously the game being coded for the players to look at to review their own performance. But then, as soon as that's done, they want to look at the next performance. They'll do their own analysis as well, and they'll know their opposition. But it's just the detail that goes into it is uh, is mind blowing. And, and for all the, the hours spent, it might just be it might make one tiny bit of difference in the game. But they're prepared to put the work and the effort in um, to find that 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 difference that can win or lose you a game. Oh, you know, Gav, from your time at Glasgow, 
a crucial role that he's got, but also that relationship with Gregor as well. It's, they've got a, they've got a great relationship, haven't they? Incredibly close. They, they meet probably more than Gregor meets with any other coaches. I've involved in every single coaches meeting. On top of that, Chris talked about uh, the players needing the stats, needing the uh, analysis, the coaches as well. The the demands on Gav and his team's time post game are huge. Now he probably now <laughs> Gregor may argue with me, but he probably knows more about rugby than anybody else in that coaching team because of the amount of rugby that he studies. He's a, he's an absolute rugby geek, um, and he brings out brilliant stats and picks bits of information up from all over the world that can then be used in, in the Scottish game. Moving on to our club focus feature this week, it's Burnham Year, and here they are to talk about their transition into Super Six. I'm David Campbell. I'm director of youth rugby at Burnham Year. Yeah, I'm Scott Anderson. I'm the academy director looking after the rugby side. Um, I think um, a, the last two or three years in particular have seen um, a transformation at Burnham Year Rugby Club in terms of our outlook on, on where we're going, um, having a clear vision and, a, and working towards a style of rugby that um, is more exciting. Um, but we've developed the whole business model round about the rugby club and we've revamped everything and there's a, a real feeling of um, optimism and people looking forward to the future and we think that it's an exciting time for us uh, and, and we're looking forward to the challenges that uh, Super 6 brings and the conference set up for the youth side as well. You've obviously uh, recently just won Tenants Club of the Month for, for December. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means to the club? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it goes a long way to um, recognising um, the amount of effort that's been put in uh, to transform this club, as I said previously. Um, it it, it kind of just vindicates all of the hard work that's been put in. Um, I think as the main sponsor for um, a, the, the, the league to recognise us in that way, um, it just goes to show you how much we've come on in leaps and bounds in the last few years. You've recently had some success with the Mitsubishi Motors Conferences. Can you tell us a little bit about the activity there, Scott? Yep. Um, certainly winning the Shogun Conference for um, obviously for Burnham Muir was um, a fantastic achievement for us this year. It was certainly our goal that we set out um, after kind of narrowly losing out by a point last season uh, to Stirling County. So we're always um, you know, looking this year to maybe go on better. Um, I think the progress we had across all our age groups um, was fantastic. It was, you know, a huge um, improvement and progression that we had, um, as I say, from every age group, from the under 13s to the under 18s. Um, and we set goals at different age groups, um, and certainly, you know, winning the under 15 and under 18 league um, was a huge positive, and certainly under 18s, that was a massive achievement for us as a club. Um, and, and pushing clubs like Stirling County, who have obviously had successes in there in the past, so. Um, that was huge, but also even teams like an under 16s have set them goals and they've been improving. So, um, yeah, it was a, obviously a, a great achievement for us and something that we wanted to make sure that we uh, you know, had a chance of winning. Um, and to win it the way we did and secure the title was, um, you, you know, was fantastic. Um, but I think it's been from you know it's a combination of things that we've already said. Um, it's, you know, the investment we've had in the coaches. Um, we have an academy manager now, and we also have managed to take on an assistant development officer this year so we've put coaching programmes in place that are run throughout every age group so every age group is doing the same kind of areas um, concentrating on different skills throughout the year um, and we're trying to progress all the coaches there's more coaches going on uh, UK CC level courses we're trying to get them all qualified up um, and that's definitely having an effect on what we're actually delivering to the to all our youth players. It's uh, going to be a very exciting uh, time for Barra Muir. Can you give us a sort of flavour of the aspirations and, and, and what's in future in store for the club? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly for, from a club level, we want to improve every facet of the club. So um, this is this is more than just a rugby club. So this is a community sports hub here. And, and we're very, very keen to maintain that. There are 17 sports clubs that work out of Megatland and we galvanise that uh, into, into one kind of sporting uh, uh, um, uh, arena. Uh, so our facilities here have been improved 
dramatically over the years, but we, we don't want to rest on our laurels here and we're, we're trying to encourage uh, more participation from all the other clubs as well. We have aspirations to, to, to build the facilities here and improve on the facilities here for, for rugby and for everybody. Um, more social events as well to bring all the clubs closer together. Um, from a rugby perspective, the Super 6 um, takes it to the next level there. And we worked really, really hard as a board uh, and as a club um, to, to, to win one of the franchises. Uh, um, we, we see that as a future for Scottish rugby. And we see that as a future for, for this club as well. So we want to build on that from grassroots level right the way through to Super 6. For more on the Tenants Premiership and National League One, head over to our official YouTube channel and check out the highlights from last weekend competition time and we're giving away a signed 2019 Six Nations Scotland squad shirt to one lucky new Scottish Rugby podcast listener. To enter, visit our Scottish Rugby Facebook page and comment on our podcast competition post with the answer to our simple question. Terms and conditions are on the website. One more thing before we go, I want to get everyone's thoughts on this. Subs celebrating in the dead ball area. Oh, stop it! After a try has been scored, stop Mossy. it! You know you you, you said me up here. I know you think it's brilliant. <laughs> I hate it. Of course you, you do. You're all part of the team. You're so all part of the team. Grumpy. No. No. Well, yes, but no. So if you're a sub, you're not part of the team. No, when Is you're not on the field. I, I I I'm I'm a stickler for the the laws here. Right? I I just don't <laughs> like it. I I think it's disrespectful for the opposition. If some guy maybe they should have defended girl. better yeah but, 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 it's, but I just think it's wrong <laughs> and it, it, I think in all honesty it's going to cause a bit of a flash point at some dis- some point I think it is I know you love it Al you've been all that <laughs> I do love it I think it's I, great I, you see the emotion the bit that annoys me but you're pushing folk out the way to get in the pilot and like oh see if that happened to me it was, I, I think it was, it was a, the, <laughs> the Leicester game at the weekend um, when Ulster scored every single sub was in celebrating the ball gets kicked off under a minute agree it probably cause a flashpoint but it doesn't annoy me as much as celebrating other people's mistakes I which seem that. to be yeah, happening yeah, that's a little bit. Oh, it was happening so much at the weekend that any time anybody made a mistake there was three or four of the opposition players round tapping them on the head and, and pushing them but down. any game They're, in particular you're referring to or uh, just certain games yeah. but that, that <laughs> one of the six you watched that was to be outlawed two or three years ago as well. That was one of the, the, the key um, kind of uh, directives for the referees, the, the sarcasm, because it will eventually lead to a flashpoint, as will, I think, the, the subs. Yes, emotion overrun, but you, you can't even sprint onto the field and dive in the pile up, can you? I've got a bigger issue with the celebrating other people's mistakes. I like the subs, you know, talk about 23 man squad and they've got to win and lose together. That's part of it. Well, why can't I just come on and make a tackle then? <laughs> it's the same argument. It's not the same argument. Yes. The game's the whistle's gone. The game's dead at that point. They're in the dead oh. ball area and they're celebrating. I don't hear the whistle at that point. <laughs> I know I'm in the minority, but I think it'll cause. It's going to cause chaos. Well, thank you all for your time. We'll be back next week with more exclusive content here on the official Scottish Rugby Podcast.